This episode, I'm joined by Stephen Dowden, who is Professor of German Literature at Brandeis University. We discuss the work of Thomas Bernhard. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast and keep everything running, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Steve Dowden, thanks very much for joining us on Emetics Podcast. I'm glad to be here. We are going to be discussing the work of Thomas Bernhard, uh, known for many mm, pessimistic novels, miserable novels, miserable writing, um, primarily known for, it's difficult to say, but I would say The Loser, Woodcutters are the two uh, most popular ones, I believe. Um, and I'm taking these questions, this research, primarily from two books. So your own book, Understanding Thomas Bernhard, which was published in uh, 1991, and also the somewhat recent Thomas Bernhard's Afterlives, uh, published in 2020, which you co-edited with Olaf Berwald and Gregor Thus Waldner. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing them correctly. And this is a collection of essays on the work of Thomas Bernhard. Um, so before we jump in with, with Bernhard's work itself, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and uh, how it is you came to be so interested in Bernhard to, to have this quite a long career on Bernhard. Well, it's all kind of accidental, and I'll tell you how it happened. When I was an undergraduate, at Texas Tech University in West Texas, I uh, majored in German, and my principal professor was a man named Theodor Alexander, who was a Jewish refugee from Nazi Austria. Wow. Now, this is this is interesting because my undergraduate German education was steeped in Austrian literature in a way that's unusual in the United, United States. It's it's mostly Germany, 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 and Austria is sort of forgotten. So I, you know, I studied Grillparzer and Karl Kraus and uh, all these relatively obscure figures, or at least seemingly at the time. By the time I graduated, I still didn't speak German. So I got lucky and got a fellowship. And of course, I didn't want to go to Germany. I wanted to go to Austria. So I studied for a year in Graz, Austria, did finish learning German. And the two names I heard most in contemporary literature were Peter Handke and Thomas Bernhardt. Mm. And I became interested right away in Peter Handke. And I didn't read anything by Thomas Bernhardt till later, but he was much on my mind. So eventually I got a, I got a job and uh, published my dissertation, which was about uh, German modernism, but it was mostly Austrian. And, uh, to continue, you know, you have to write a second book. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll write a second book on uh, Kafka. And I was trying to get it rolling. And uh, then I was diagnosed with cancer. And that pretty much, that pretty much took the wind out of my sails. This was, this was in the mid 1980s. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kafka, as you, I'm sure you know, was sort of energized by illness. When he was diagnosed with tuberculosis, it set him free from his job, which meant he was free to write. But I, I pretty well found it paralyzing. Mm -hmm. You know, I lost interest in reading Kafka and I had nothing to say. And in fact, they cured me. You mm -hmm. know, a couple of operations turned the trick. So I had sort of a bad year. And when I came out of that year, I was thinking, well, you know, I'm not going to continue with this project. I just couldn't get it off the ground. So what am I going to do? And I got a call from an editor who was running a series called Understanding So-and-So. And he asked me if I would write a book called Understanding Somebody. And I said, okay, how about Thomas Bernhardt? And uh, he said, sure. But see, I still hadn't read anything by Thomas <laughs> Bernhardt at this time. And it so happened that I was going to spend a year in Yugoslavia, so I took all of Thomas Bernhardt's books, and I started at the beginning with Frost, and I read forward, and I was shocked to find that every book was pretty much the same as the last. And I thought, what in the world am I going to find to say about Thomas Bernhardt? So that's how that first book, uh, Understanding Thomas Bernhardt, came into being. I uh, actually... Marguerite Yourcenar has something to do with that. I had read Marguerite Yourcenar's uh, long essay, little book on uh, Mishima, and I thought that's the way to write. So I was I was imitating Marguerite Yourcenar in that book. 
And uh, after that, I you know continued to read Thomas Bernhardt, and Thomas Bernhardt gradually became more popular in the United States, or at least, I guess popular is not the right word, but gradually all of his prose came into print. I think by now, virtually all of it is, including some of the most obscure stuff. Though interestingly, not much of the drama. A number of things are published, but in the, always in obscure places, and his theater hasn't had much success. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. I mean, I've seen a picture of like someone with the full, the full translated you know, and that's just the translated sort of stack. And it's like, man, yeah. this guy produced a lot. I mean, you know, I'm, you're not gonna, I'm not going to run out of, uh, I'm not going to run, run out of Bernhard anytime soon. It's interesting that you say about, uh, your experience with Frost and then going forward, because this is actually literally mirrors my own experience. I was looking for a burn, like my first Bernhard to read. And everywhere I went, everyone just said a different book. And I was like, huh. And then I saw this one comment that said, just start with Frost, because if you enjoy that, you'll enjoy the rest. Like, they're quite, kind of one in the same. And I would slightly disagree with that now, but that disagreement comes after reading a lot. Like, you have to read a lot to start going, okay, there's, I'm starting to see the nuances. But for the first five or so, it's like, okay, here we go, another another rant without without page breaks, you know. Um, but, you know, if you enjoy it, you enjoy it. But Frost, is, Frost still remains my favorite. Um, so... I guess we're talking around the man, which he would hate. Um, who was this guy? Who was Thomas Bernhard? Because, you know, you, you mentioned this popularity thing. I think it's a, it's a strange discussion that he's known but maybe not read, or I don't know, like it's tough to discern just how popular he is, if that word even fits him. Um, so who is this guy? You know, who was Thomas Bernhard? I've sort of avoided this question myself because, you know... I I think it might not be possible to know who he was. You know, the typical thing for German writers is that they're public intellectuals. They're constantly writing essays. They're constantly in the public eye. You know, think about in the 1960s, it was people like uh, Gunter Grass, for example, right? Who was a political activist. And that's the German idea of a writer, a writer with a message. Mm. Thomas Bernhardt, I don't think has a message. He, you know, he's, he's writing from from somewhere else and it's that somewhere else that interests me that's why i've sort of avoided his biography a little bit but you can't avoid it completely because he writes about it himself and certainly his mm. his memoirs are among the you know his most achieved works they're they're really good to read both in english and in german yeah so i mean just one note on that uh that uh, regarding this biography and it's not something i want to stay on too long maybe maybe we it, it comes through better, I think, through his work. But uh, the one biography that's translated into English is uh, Gita Honegek, which is the one I read. And to be honest, I didn't find much out about the man himself from that. It was like, okay, well, I'm still nonplussed. The yeah. only thing I really discerned from it was, unfortunately, because often I'll go to a biography because, oh, I like the work. Maybe I'll find a kindred spirit. I, I finished that biography thinking, I don't want to hang out with Bernhard. This guy's a bit of a... He's, he's pretty bit, odd. He's odd and, and a bit of an ass, you know. Like I, <laughs> he, I just he really thought, is. yeah. So, so if you refer the literature back to him, you know, it, it makes the literature sound kind of bad. You know, Gitta, get I think wrote that book in English. She is, oh, okay. uh, you know, she's she is a native Austrian, and she did know Bernhardt, mm -hmm. and she, she knows the milieu from which he emerged. I mean, to tell you the truth, I didn't read that book. Okay, for the for. The, you know, for the reason that I just gave, because I don't even want to know okay. too much about it biographically. But I, I will tell you, once I asked, in the, this was in the 19th, when I was working on my, my little Bernhardt essay, I asked Gitta what it was like in the late 1960s, when she must have been a teenager living in Vienna, what was it in Austria to experience Bernhardt's writings when it first came out? Mm. This is sort of key from my understanding of Bernhardt. Mm. She got a far away look in her eye and she said it was exhilarating and it was liberating. So I think those are both really important remarks. Yeah. And it was liberating because Gitta belonged to this first, maybe second, first, second post-war generation where in Austria, nobody talked about the war, but it was on everybody's mind all the time, and they felt its oppression. So along came Thomas Bernhardt, 
and he expressed the rage and frustration that they all felt. And I think that I think that must be what she meant when she said it was both liberating and exhilarating. Yeah, and this uh, I mean this is played out very well actually. In- as we were speaking of it, it's played out very well in Frost. It doesn't even really play a central role. It plays like a backdrop in this uh, ominous sort of surrounding forest where Bernhard makes it clear that anyone who goes there just occasionally gets blown up by an unexploded bomb. This sort of That's right. uh, haunt of the war just left there yeah. with horrible yeah. wreckages. Um that book is passed. So that's, that's 1963, you know. That's yeah. the war is really a, a living memory for most everybody. Mhm. And yeah, and and he somehow manages to imbue that with some a sense of guilt which rises throughout his work which is interesting which you know it brings me to a a question that i always like i'm reluctant to ask because it seems so like obvious uh but 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 so open that it's difficult but how would you describe bernhardt's work well i you know i experienced it as exhilarating too so he's only got a handful of themes and all of his books work pretty much the same way there's a, a narrator Uh, who describes a ranting figure, or sometimes it's the ranting figure himself, and the works are always just long monologues, like you said, with no paragraph breaks and, you know, no, no chapters. There's no, there's no rest for the, for the reader, but the prose is so good that it carries you along. It's kind of a wild experience. And it's the experience that accounts above all more than any kind of a propositional claim that the author may be making and i think he's really not making any propositional claims including the ones that he pretends to make <laughs> and also on paper if you wrote that down on paper you said i've got this book it's a uh, you know 200 pages long there's no paragraph breaks um it's miserable uh, it's a rant from someone you may not even like and also on top of that it's really repetitive most of the time is someone going over the same thing for about five, six pages. I'm reminded of uh, Old Masters, one of my favorite sections, where he's just going on about Heidegger. And you know yeah. full well, Bernhard just, he thought, you know what, I'm just going to put down how much I really hate Heidegger, <laughs> uh, which I loved. But on paper, that shouldn't work. So the fact that he's managed to write so many books in that style is a testament to something there that is... Um, Dare I say, like, like I don't know. This, it's, to, I mean, your essay in Thomas Bernhardt's Afterlives, the collection, actually focuses on the style, and I think the style and the flow and the pace is so key. Without it, we wouldn't really have Bernhardt. So, what was it? What is it about this style you think that that just that just works? Well, you're right. For me, that's the key question, and so I want to come at it from an oblique angle. I've been reading. I've been reading Nietzsche lately with students, so it's on my mind. Hmm. So in The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche, uh, right at the outset, argues that it's not the story that counts. The story comes much later. Tragedy was born in singing and dancing. So it's the singing and dancing that count, and then later the story is added on to it. And that's really, you know, the opposite, for example, of movies, you know, the movies in a movie, the story is the main thing. And they add some music to heighten the emotion or tell you that something scary is about to happen or whatever. But in tragedy, according to Nietzsche, as far as I can tell, this is really true. It was originally the chorus and the singing and the dancing that counted. It was the music. Mm-hmm. I think that's true of Bernhardt's too. The real action is in the the musical the musical language which frames the story it's not the story that comes first in pra- in fact there's, there's practically no story there at all you know like you said it's it's all repetitive there are no there's no character development nothing really ever happens except that uh, the, the the narrator will tell you all of the irritations that bother him and the moral problems of modern life but nothing happens so it's really the music that does it. So I'm, I'm with uh, Marshall McLuhan here. The medium is the message in, in, in Bernhardt. It's the style and the music that carries everything else. But, but, you know, that raises this other difficult question. So, uh, you know, a hostile critic would say, oh, so it's, it's all form and no content. But that's not true. No, that's not true. So even if the content isn't the main thing, it's really, it's, it's still there. So the content is what? It's, uh, 
it's sort of like in in Nietzsche, the wisdom of Silenus, that the the best thing is to not be born at all, and the second best thing is to die young. <laughs> I mean, this this notion of narrative, it's quite funny because when you know, at the end of the day, there has to be something there that you know quote unquote happens for any story to make any sense at all um even if it's some sort of french prose you know someone was telling me recently about a 60 page french prose which is just the description of a vase of flowers i mean you have to have the vase of flowers so i think of the loser right and the sense that something does happen in that in the sense that you meet glenn gould you meet Wertenheimer, and you meet the protagonist and really the trajectory of that book is that what both of those characters meet gould and that completely ruins any of their aspirations because they go, this guy is, you know, we're never going to be as good as this guy. So there's, what's the point in doing it? And one of the characters, Wertenheimer, if I'm getting this right, my memory is pretty bad at the moment. One of the characters then commits suicide because, you know, his dreams have been ruined. But the point, the, the point that you were making about the narrative is you find this out on page two. Right. So you That's find right. out. So, you know, Bernhard sort of immediately bursts your bubble in terms of, look, there's the whole plot in two pages. This guy meets Gould. It, it ruins his aspirations as a pianist because Gould is that good to so kills himself. You already know this. So somehow he manages to continue to form what is actually of importance, which is really, I guess, but it's not in a development. It's not character development because if memory serves it well. Neither of those characters really develop over the course of it. They're bitter from day one when they meet Gould. I mean, they, they both immediately know. So what, what, what is it that's happening? Music, as you say? We're just here to listen to Bernhard's music. Uh, well, that's you know that's the that's the problem as I see it. We're not, and you know you you know we're not, and I know we're not. But it's sort of hard. It's sort of hard to explain. You know what is the relationship between the medium and what, for better or for worse, I guess we'll have to to call the message. I mean, in this case, I would take the theme to be that perfection is deadly. This is something that comes up over and over in Thomas Bernhardt's books. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to call that a message. It's just kind of an odd idea, but like the, the perfection of the cone in correction is what kills uh, Reuthammer's sister, you know, are, are in the lime works, you know, Conrad is, wants to write the perfect study of hearing, but you know, that I, the I, very prospect of writing such a perfect work, paralyzes him and he never gets anywhere he murders his wife and, and so forth so you know wanting perfection mm. is not good for you mm. it's not good for you but in terms of a point in terms of maybe a, a message as you say to stay on that sort of McLuhan line Bernhard does have it I mean he's known for an emphasis on um now there's there's loads of words and I I like this about um the negative side of uh, human existence. So I think we have more nuanced words for misery than any like, than there are. You know, if you're happy, you're happy. Right? You don't need any more words for that. But if you're miserable, I mean, you can be miserable, you can be pessimistic, you can be nihilistic, be sad, yeah. you can be upset. And I'm always intrigued as to what word fits the author. And for me, I don't know if this is right, but Bernhard is palpably miserable. I don't think he's nihilistic. Uh, I think there's definitely pessimism there, but just the settings. The settings and the fact that the characters are already miserable. There hasn't been some development to make them miserable. You know, in Frost, the, the, the I can't remember the guy's name, but you know, the, the town of Vang, I believe it's called. I mean, it's already a miserable setting. Everyone there is already miserable. They're all, and, yeah. You know, there's no development into this. And so why why does Bernard, I mean, and you'd be hard pressed to find one of his books that doesn't, that does include some, uh, something you could pinpoint and say, that's optimistic. Well, what's Bernhard's obsession with this? Do you think? Why does he repeat? Well, in, what I would say is that if I had to take just one word, I would I would say outrage. Bernard is permanently outraged, and that's where that's where the emphasis comes. Uh, the, that's why he writes so much because the outrage never leaves him. It mm -hmm. never leaves. Him. So what he's writing about is these other people's misery. I don't think he was miserable in the least. He was probably pretty miserable during his childhood, mm -hmm. but he plainly loved to write. He could. He just wrote and wrote and wrote, and I think he got something out of it. Certainly, he got a lot of money out of it. He talks about he talks about that, and he got a lot of prestige out of it. And I think he enjoyed that in spite of himself. But I, I have the impression he never quite believed in it. He knew that it was sort of an 
illusion that he that he was a snob and sort of a phony, but his real life was in the writing, not in the, the accolades that he received. So he wasn't a hypocrite then, because a lot of his work is, you know, I mean, woodcutters would be the the emphatic uh, example of this. A lot of his work is targeted at a critique of, you know, Austrian uh, culture as almost the height of bourgeoisie, um, what we'd call in the UK, um, keeping up appearances, you know, yeah. well, well to doism. So, so in Austria, there are all these government sponsored prizes that he kept that he kept winning, but he hated the government. Hmm. So he always gave these insulting speeches when, when the, when the prizes would come to him. But a lot, you know, a lot of his colleagues, there are a lot of really inferior writers in Austria who were promoted by the government because they said things that they wanted to hear. And certainly Thomas Bernhardt was acutely aware of that. There are there, you know, there aren't really those kinds of prizes in the United States. Not very many, just a very few. Are there in England, Britain? Uh, I, I would just, I mean, just to listening to a lecture by William Gaddis, I mean, just a few days ago, I mean, he talks about how about 1970s onwards and to what extent do these prizes hold any esteem anymore? Like, I think, I think as well, I mean, to be elitist in a way, once certain prizes are awarded to people who you go, that's clearly has its own agenda. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be one of these people. I don't really have an opinion on it, but I remember Bob Dylan, like Bob Dylan got, was it the Nobel Prize for Literature? And someone yeah. made the, someone made the joke of like, what, what books of his have you read, right? Like, so, um, you know, I think there isn't many that hold esteem. I mean, there's ones that you could say, okay, that kind of means you're well known. There's like the, the Man Booker Prize, I think is the, probably the biggest mm-hmm. one. But to the extent that you're getting them, it's probably the same as Bernhard of like, what's, why have you, why have you got them? You know, yeah. I mean, the reasoning behind getting awards. So, yeah, um, that's a tough one. So the thing about Austria is it's a very small, tightly knit country without that big of population. Mm. So everybody notices these things, right? They always know what's going on. And, you know, people, at least, you know, when I lived there, it's been a long time now, people really read a lot mm. and uh, talked about novels a lot. I can't say that's really true where I live, but uh, in Austria it was. No, it's not true in the UK. We talk about TV. Good, normal people talk about TV shows. Well-adjusted <laughs> people talk about TV. <laughs> um, so the question that always that I always uh, always interests me with these, I mean, I love pessimistic writers. I love miserable writers. Geron, Bernhard, Gaddis, Celine, you name it. I mean, I love the misery. But is Bernhard nihilist? I've yet to really find a, a, um, a you know, a, a true, true blue, like someone who's truly a nihilistic writer in this style. I don't think, I don't think Bernhard is. What would you? Where would you say he fits on that? Well, that's that's what I meant when I said that the the message that the books claim to be offering, that is nihilism, really isn't the message at all. And I bring this back to the tension between. The form and the content, you know, the real the real message is in the exhilaration of the writing. You know, that's a that's a very positive embrace of life, even if even if what you're doing the entire time is complaining. <laughs> so he's you know he's not a nihilist. He's mm. and also you know he's a, you know I would say that he's a moralist too. You know, he's completely outraged by the way that the Austrian that modern Austria has squandered its great tradition, right? It, it, uh, it swooned into the arms of German Nazism with great enthusiasm. And then after the war, the Austrians claimed to be the first victims of mm. German. Nazism. And that, you know, that was a lie that uh, galled many, many people in Austria, you know, Gitte Honecker, for example, and certainly Thomas Bernhardt because of the Moscow declaration. I don't know about the Moscow Declaration. No, the Moscow Declaration. So, so there were a number of intellectuals, uh, refugee intellectuals, who left uh, Nazi Austria for England. Mm-hmm. And in England, they persuaded the authorities that uh, Austria had lots of uh, uh, freedom fighters in the country and that if uh, there could be some uh, indication uh, from the Allies, that there was support outside of Austria for them, 
then they could, there would be an uprising from the inside. So in 1943, I believe, in Moscow, the so-called Moscow Declaration said that Austria was the first country to fall to Nazi aggression. Mm. And uh, then, of course, the uh, there were there were very few freedom fighters in Austria who were going to oppose the Nazi government because in Austria it meant you know it meant jobs it meant people were going back to work it meant you could be proud to be a German speaking Austrian again. Hmm. So after the war, the uh, cynical Austrian authorities declared uh, Austria to be the first falling back on the 43 Moscow declaration they said yes indeed we were the first we are the victims we're the not only we victims we're the first victims of the nazis mm. so that you know that was an outrage that was an outrage and it was a long long time before the, the austrian government ever acknowledged that uh, in fact they were themselves enthusiastic nazis i see Bernard, Bernhard sees that sort of high and mighty Austrian culture as just being this malleable thing to try keep itself alive while at the same time pretend you know being the victim he never really lets that he never lets that lie and I mean but that 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 uh that form of perhaps sort of um weakness I guess he would perhaps see it as I mean almost like a Nietzschean weakness actually a reversal of the moralities um this seems to apply to him to major the uh, the majority of forms of authority. You know, I mean, the Catholic Church is is a big one as well, and it makes me wonder if there was any sort of um, form of authority that Bernhard found agreeable. <laughs> uh, you know, I I suppose he was a sort of an anarchist, not in the ordinary political sense, but in the words etymological sense. Uh, anarchon, which means, you know, without principle, without rule, and anarche, without beginning. You know, it's like his books have no beginning and no end. They're all kind of the same, the same book. And they don't follow, they don't follow the official rules of post-war novel writing. In fact, he refused to call them novels. Mm. So that's what I would say. That's what I say. He's an, he's an anarchist. He's an anarchist in the uh, German, what they call the Kulturbetrieb, the culture industry there. What did he call them? Uh, he would always give them t titles like uh, an excite, I think Woodcutters uh, was uh, an excitation or something like <laughs> that. In, in, in Germany, usually there'll be the title and at the bottom of the title page, it will say Ein Roman, a novel. Well, he didn't have that. So either there was nothing or there was a subtitle that simply avoided the whole novel question. <laughs> Do you think there was a progression between his uh, between, uh, throughout his books? I mean, we both commented at the start about this fact of going through them, you know, starting at the beginning and then going, well, hang on, this is all the same. But despite that, do you think there's a progression in his work? Does he well, it appears to me that uh, the, the first half of his career from Frost to Correction I mean, the mood is tremendous bitterness. And you can also see him working on his style. If you go back and read Frost after having read some of the later stuff, you can see that it's not, it's not as polished. It's not quite as accomplished as they are. But it makes up for that in raw, raw freshness. I mean, this is, so this is 1963, and nobody else has written a novel like this. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this strange new form, you know, and Bernhardt's not the kind of guy who sits around like Thomas, you know, Thomas Mann writing his novels. He'll write a dozen letters a day telling people he's starting a new novel, what it's going to be about, what it's going to mean and how he's going to write it. You know, there, there aren't those kinds of letters available in Bernhardt or Thomas, Thomas Mann will write all these essays about literature, what he thinks of literature. There's none of that in Thomas Bernhardt, you know, where in, you know, where in the world did this style come from? It just, it just seems to appear out of nowhere. So anyway, 1963 to correction, whenever, whatever year it was published, there's uh, you can see him working working on his routine. And then after that, I feel like he, he felt like he had it down. And mm. the mood is still dark, but his his touch is lighter. And there's a, there's a more comic edge to his works, like in you know Old Masters, the very last one. Is pretty funny. It's a pretty funny book, as dark, you know, as dark as it is. 
You don't think he mellows out, though? Well, he gives us more to laugh at, but he's not mellower. Mm. But so it seems to me. Do you think he finds um? Do you think he finds a different purpose, or do you think this is still all the same? Um, I think it's. I think it's all the same purpose. I think. I think it's mm. his writing is still fueled by this ongoing outrage of the things that were done to him when he was young, the things that were done to Austria as he saw that it ought to be, um, as he thought it should be. He was he's permanently he's permanently angry about it. A writer fueled by anger and illness, it seems. I mean it seems to be his sole fuel is just anger and illness. Then that's right. Mm-hmm. What you know <laughs> His, you know, his illness. So that was, you know, that was part of that attracted me to Bernhard once I started reading because I just, you know, I had had cancer and I thought, well, am I going to die? Am I not going to die? And then I didn't, you know, my case was not nearly as radical as his, but uh, I sort of identified with this whole illness thing. You know, you also have to think of Kafka when you think of this illness. Like I said before, Kafka was liberated by his illness. And I think that Thomas Bernhardt, in some sense, was liberated from sort of the quotidian order of the day in Austria, right? Austria is a small country. You have to you have to cooperate in order to get along. But I think after he survived his near-death experience, he was just not in the mood to cooperate, and he was not going to cooperate. And, uh, you know, if, you know, if his writing had failed utterly and Publishers have said, "Well, we can't publish this. This is awful." You know, he would have, he probably would have kept writing, uh, uh, but uh, you know, as it turned out, he was fabulously successful, sort of like, sort of like Beckett. So, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile this tremendous success in the publishing industry with uh, the dark pessimism of his fundamental themes? I don't think you can reconcile them. You just have to note that it happened and go on. The best writers are the ones who were ill. That's what. That's my personal rule. I mean, Blanchot was ill. Nietzsche, Schopenhauer. Does, al- does alcoholism count? You know, there's so there's so many alcoholic writers. I think too. so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Alcoholism, or or a like maybe a, a serious drug problem at some point. Maybe. I think there's something different. Like it'd be interesting to actually um, correlate writers in that sense of like. Those who had alcohol problem, those who had natural illness. I feel like the ones who had a natural illness, they all gravitate around the same uh, uh, strange relationship to what it is to even be alive. I guess for Bernhard, though, that that because I mean it was pretty chronic and constant, probably not very nice. Uh, it was mostly lung conditions, I believe. That probably was you know more real than real, as as in in terms of when you're surrounded by this very uh, uh, mm. what would you call it. Like a facade of the Austrian culture, very on the surface, very twee, we would say in the UK. And I guess when you've got a painful, horrible lung condition, you suddenly start to see what is actually real about life. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. So so real life in Austria seemed phony to him. And, you know, his real life was his was his illness because that was very it was very fundamental. I mean you mentioned you mentioned Blanchot, who I think was put before a firing squad. You know, he had a, a, this important brush with mortality. Mm. So illness, you know, illness and mortality go together. Mm. What do you think it was for Bernhard to be even to exist, to be alive? Or do you think that his writing doesn't actually, even though it might seem that way, his writing doesn't actually stretch to these far reaching existential questions that actually it's, we should always try to keep it in the bounds of, uh, you know, that sort of that time after World War Two within Austria. Well, that's what I meant about the importance of the style, because it comes out in in the writing as writing, even apart from the themes. You know, it's the writing that's an embrace of life, even if it's an angry, even if it's an angry embrace. You know, the exhilaration that we feel when we read Bernhardt, that comes from his anger and from, you know, or, or take the whole question of Austria. Mm. You know, I, you know. People say, well, you know, why did he hate Austria so much? And the answer is because he loved Austria so much. Mm-hmm. And he felt the Austria that he loved had been betrayed by the people who were its guardians, whether they be writers or politicians. 
So he's or or, or the Catholics, you know, this whole Catholic thing. Mm-hmm. I have some speculation about if you if you look at his very earliest writings, which he didn't want anybody to republish, and so far as I know, they haven't. They're pretty Catholic, you know. They're they're very grotesque. You know, I remember one with a pig crucified in a tree. They're full of all kinds of Christological symbolism. So I, you know, I think that uh, his hostility to the Catholic Church probably, and this is this is pure speculation. I haven't mm-hmm. really looked into it seriously, but I I suspect the uh, you know the tremendous animosity that he directs against Catholicism probably has something to do with his own early youthful embrace of Catholicism, which he, you know, which he also felt had probably somehow betrayed. I wish, I wish somebody would look into that. I'm not going to look into it myself, but uh, if I were to hypothesize, that's where I would begin with these very early stories. Some... Published in Catholic journals, by the way, as I recall. I'm not sure. I think, I think that's the case. You really, you really have to go to a good library to find mm. So for Bernhard, Maybe this applies to most of his books as well. I mean, I was just reading Gargoyles this morning to get in the mood. Something has failed. And it doesn't really matter what's failed. It's that failure itself and the fact of that. In, we were talking about Nietzsche earlier. The fact of that death of something. I guess in this sense, it doesn't even have to be God. But for, you know, take take out God and throw in something else like an abstract signifier that a lot of people would use for god you know austria um and you know i said about gargoyles this um you know the medical profession come to heal you well we're following the the doctor going around and you know he's just saying like doctors are are hacks you know this is a load of nonsense everyone's horrible and you know so there's always that maybe that's maybe that's some truth to that idea that something has failed it can't be put back but we know what it should have been, and now we have to deal with the future of yeah. we, we, we're maybe, amidst maybe. failure. I, I like the, I like the way you put that. So some, something has failed, and so maybe we could say that simply that he's lost all confidence in absolutes, mm. and that's that's what's failed. You know, if if he, for example, believed in this Habsburg myth and the uh, you know the the cultural identity of Austria, which he, you know, apparent, apparently he did. He never really says anything about it, but he keeps talking about this great betrayal. Mm. So, you know, he must have believed that he must have at least wanted to believe that there was some kind of absolute, but, you know, he no, he no longer can believe in it. And that, uh, that makes him, that makes him angry. Certainly he can't believe in the doctors because he had really bad experiences with them. Mm. And he had bad experiences with the Catholic Church. You know, he talks in his memoir about how uh, it went from being Catholic to Nazi, and it was hard to tell the difference. That's mm. <laughs> Bern- Bernhardian humor again. It's not wrong. Do you think anything holds stability for him in a positive? Like, so everything we've we've spoken about so far that holds stability for him, we might um, we would probably most people would probably deem negative. So, you know, illness is the thing that's stable. The hypocrisy is stable. Uh, the failure, you know, everything always fails. I mean, is there anything that he sees as uh, respite? Yeah, art. You know, he mm. you know he sees art as something that not is not stable in the sense that it's absolute, but it's the only it's the only kind of a a handle that we can get on the world. This, you know, this is one of his great themes is the failure of language. So here's here. And it's, you know, it's a really Austrian theme. It mm-hmm. goes back at least to Hofmann's talk. Mm-hmm. So this whole failure of language thing is interesting. So why should, why should a novelist, if he is a novelist, why should a fiction writer claim that, uh, you know, language can't be relied on? Well, you know, it means that, uh, it's, it's all we have. So we have to use it. Mm. We'd be nowhere without it. So he continues to write as best he can while building into his fiction the knowledge that nothing he says either is absolute, but that there is some kind of a respite, uh, as you put it, in art. It's, a, it's at least a brief resting, resting place. Not one that's absolute, but, uh, but it can be a way of life. It was for him a way of life. And, of course, the people he admires are you know the the artists and in some cases conductors for example who's you know who's the better conductor and i think that's in Wittgenstein's nephew that comes up 
Karyan, or I can't remember who the alternative is, but, but you know, it's it's not a really important question, but it's something that it's something that excites them. You know, it excites the mind and uh, appeals to the heart too, and that's what art can do. Even the even the darkest art, mm-hmm. even the darkest art, has this uh, this positive valence as art. There's a great irony there, though. I mean, as you say about the Aus- Austrian culture and language, of course, we have Wittgenstein himself. Um, another another miserable life. Um, and this this attempt then to communicate something, which is sort of going back to the McLuhan thing you referenced, you know, this, this problem of communication, but we've sort of made it clear what Bernhard wants to communicate, at least uh, in our own opinion, I guess. And he continues to do so. And... And that's it. And somehow that works. I, don't, I haven't really got a question there, but somehow that works. Somehow that, that, uh, I mean, I, so in Nietzsche terms, as we were speaking about Nietzsche, you know, you have the difference between the passive and active nihilist and the passive nihilist who would lay down, uh, once they've internalized the, the uh-huh. truth of the death of God. And then the active nihilist would say, well, you know, now is the time to overcome. And Bernhard's sort of overcoming, <laughs> uh, I don't know, it's almost like still got one foot in the, one foot in the swamp, one foot in the sludge. Like it can't fully. Like he still wants well, to deal yeah. with. It. He still wants to deal with the problem that's happened. He's like caught in the middle. But it keeps on. You know, it keeps on writing. He keeps mm. on writing until he can't write anymore. That's what's. That's what's interesting about it. Or that's you know that's what I see as the tremendously positive dimension of Bernhardt's artistry. Because I you know I experience it now as positive in the same way that I experience Nietzsche as positive. And I was sort of thinking of Nietzsche when I said, you know, even if Bernhardt had not been successful, the way Nietzsche was not successful, Nietzsche, sick as he was, he just kept writing and writing and writing, even though you know, he was sick and he couldn't see and he had these debilitating migraines. But the amount he wrote is tremendous. I suspect if Bernhardt had not been successful, he would have just kept writing in the same sense that Nietzsche did. You know, the Nietzsche scholar that I've had on, had on a few times, Paul Bishop, he says that uh, he has, has this idea. Um, uh, he just, yeah, he floated this idea that you know Nietzsche was well aware of his sort of like time is you know the times times trickling away, and that was why he just went through so many styles so quickly. Like a, you know, I've got to just get this get this out, sort of complete overflow. And it seems that probably the same thing happening with you know, Bernhard there, the memento mori is evident every single day. I guess, especially when you're like, I mean, in Nietzsche's case, you've got a migraine so bad that you're throwing up or in Bernhard's case, your lungs are probably aching or you have to lay down all day or whatever it might be. That makes you think, yeah, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to get back to the, get back to writing, get back to doing what, what is the only purpose in my life? I I mean, just out of, just out of uh, interest, do you think if you hadn't had the cancer, Bernhard would have stuck. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He, he would have. It's just sort of a, it's just sort of a coincidence that I had this, this moment. It didn't even occur to me until much later that I had this moment of, moment of identification with him. I mean, my, my original feeling was, you know, I agreed to write this book. What in the world am I going to say about this? Because nothing I had ever written about before had prepared me to think, in this strange way that his books require you to think mm. you know, but if you're a, you know, if you're a young academic, there are certain kinds. Of, so w- I, I went to graduate school at Berkeley. So mm. from Texas tech in 1978, I went to Berkeley and I discovered that nothing I had learned there had any value at Berkeley because everybody there was talking about Derrida and grammatology. And I had never heard of Derrida or grammatology. So I had some, uh, I had some catching up to do. Mm. And that was the vein you were supposed to write in. Mm. Either that or, or you're supposed to, you were supposed to be a leftist and write about Brecht and feminism all the time. So so between those two choices, you know, there was no place for Bernhardt to fit in. And that's, you know, the, the original reception of Bernhardt by ac- academia in the 1970s and really into the 1980s was, okay, what, is, what does this mean politically? Is Bernhardt <laughs> on the right or Bernhardt on the left? And of course, you can't get at it that way. And for whatever reason, the deconstructionists who could have been interested in Bernhardt weren't because they were more interested in deconstructing romanticism because there were certain implied claims in the tradition of the academic study of romanticism that they wanted to dismantle. 
so it wasn't until later that uh, that, Ber- that Bernhardt found an audience. Interestingly, here's here's something I just remembered. So mm-hmm. back in the 1980s, when I was working on this Bernhardt book, and there wasn't very much translated, I I I, call, I was interested that Bernhardt was published by Knopf, you know, the most the most prestigious publisher in the United States. So I called him up and I spoke to Jane Brown. I think her name is Jane Brown. Uh, she was the editor. And I said, well, you know, I can't, I can't imagine that Bernhardt is going to be a big money maker. How come you're publishing him? And she said, we're doing it for the prestige. I thought that was very interesting. I thought that was very interesting. Well, I think Bernhard would have laughed at that as well. <laughs> like we don't really care about the content, care about the name. It's like a brand name. I was going to say uh, when you were mentioning him, I think Bernhard would have loathed Derrida. I think he would have uh, been, no doubt he would have been a <laughs> no good, he would have been a good target. <laughs> they deconstructed yeah. everything except the university that paid them a wage. Is always my they always I always find that interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. Hmm. How was how was uh, Bernhard like? Um, how has his work influenced your life? Have you um, taken anything from him? Yeah, he's in. You know, he's very much influenced my understanding of what art is. So, and, and what I mean by that is that I think art is never the statement. It never is never the proposition that it appears to be making, but it's the way that it's made. So if you look, for instance, you know, if you uh, look at 19th century painting, it's always a painting of something. And then you come into the 20th century and pretty soon it's abstract and pretty soon it's non-objective. Mm. And if you go and look at a bunch of Rothko's in a museum, mm. they're fabulously beautiful, but they're not about anything. They're mm. just these color fields. So if you take that knowledge, and this is what I take from Bernhardt, and project it back on paintings that are about something, it turns out that it doesn't make any difference what they're about, you know, that the uh, the, the force, the aesthetic force, or the aesthetic uh, knowledge that you gain from them is something apart from any kind of a propositional statement. Yeah. You know, Beckett, you know, Beckett says the same thing, too, when he's, when he's talking about Joyce's uh, early version of Finnegan's Wake, he says this, this is not about something. This is something. And that's true of Bernhardt, too. And I learned it from Bernhardt. You know, Bernhardt's work is not about something. It is something. Mm. And what it is, is uh, is elevating. It's exhilarating. It's interesting you reference it there in relation to, you know, the non-objective art. I mean, it will give me the only opportunity I've ever had to reference my favorite artist, which is a chap called, well, was called, Ad Reinhardt, who amidst, yeah. amidst the abstract expressionists which were tough enough for people at the time he's there mixing so he would mix turpentine with paint with black paint and then one would just be just black and then he'd take a whole tube of black with a smidge or a tiny amount of red and let that sit for months and then paint five foot by five foot black paintings with three by three black squares on them and these are these are still these still are my probably my favorite paintings because they just can't they 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 are unable to be digitalized because when you you have to stand in front of them for 20 minutes because the colors are so subtle only the human eye so you stand in front of them and the painting literally appears to you because he's done this with the paint and uh i mean it's kind of it was quite a funny bit of art history because they actually had to cordon off at Reinhardt's exhibition amongst the expressionists, the abstract expressionists, because like, oh, the public won't get this. This is too much. You know, you, like we couldn't deal. With, we couldn't deal with that. So there's something there. I think with Bernhard, if you go in, going right, well, what am I seeing? You know, what am I going to look at? Am I going to look at a tree? Am I going to look at a? What's this person's deal? What's the agenda? There's no agenda. Go enjoy it. Go enjoy. Well, go uh, experience it. You have to stand there for a while though, and. Um, you know, I wouldn't blame people if they read four or five Bernhard books. Said I enjoy it, but I don't get it. I would completely understand that in a way. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think that's a a good thing to emphasize is that sort of experience. 
Incidentally, I feel the same way about Agnes Martin that you do about Ad Reinhardt. Same generation. She also didn't fit in. She was also very, very, you know, very different and went off and lived in New Mexico by herself and just kept painting. And uh, they're all kind of the same, all these lines and uh, bars. And you look at it and you think, well, this is nothing. But pretty soon, pretty soon it kind of seeps in that it really is something. But you, you get it not by intellection, but by allowing it to seep in. And I think that was my experience with Fahrenheit, too. I, I was sitting there in this library in Zagreb reading book after book after <laughs> book, thinking, how can I talk about this? And then, you know, by osmosis, gradually, I came to understand what was going on with it. Well, that's the peculiar by, I not by not being too intellectual about it. I mean, and that's the peculiar thing about Bernhard that there isn't, the, and, a, and a great irony in a way, there's not many authors who I enjoy who I can read back to back. I mean, my favorite author is Cormac McCarthy. I would, if I had to pin it down, I can read about two of his back to back and then I'm exhausted. Bernhard of all authors, you would think there's no way I could read a couple of these, but you you can just go through them. They're yeah. um, they're not easy. Yeah. I'm not going to say they're easy, but you can go through them. Cor Cormac McCarthy, I think, works the same way that that, that Bernhardt does. I mean, if you look at a book like Blood Meridian, mm. it's probably the darkest book I've ever read, mm. but the prose is just entrancingly beautiful. And there's this tension between the darkness of the theme and the beauty of the prose. That, that makes it work and makes his you know writing exhilarating too you know I, I see that same tension between form and content in, in both writers and it's the paradox of it it's mm. the it's the contrast that makes it work I'd have to agree where would you advise people to begin with Bernhard I when, whenever people ask me I always say old masters because it's not too long, because it's pretty entertaining. It's got this wonderful rant that you talked about against against Heidegger. And I could imagine the same kind of rant against Derrida, you know, yeah. as you said. And also a rant against Stifter, which is more for Austrians, because nobody outside of Austria knows who Stifter is. But he's a sort of ur you know, or primarily Austrian. So I think it was really directed not against stifter himself but against the austrians who are constantly lionizing stifter as being a true austrian mm. anyway it's a it's the last book and i think it's the the lightest and the funniest and it's got this whole weird thing about authenticity in painting you know the two paintings are they both real is neither is neither real as one and an imitation you know what is what is real art you know that gives at least a smidgen of intellectual content mm. to hang on to so i think that makes it a, a good place to start Mm. Correct tour may be the ultimate Bernhardt novel, but it's kind of hard. It's pretty long. Yeah, I mean that, that's the only thing I guess I'd throw in is when it when his I I think his, he works better when it's you know under under two hundred, but you know under two fifty when it's short. Um, Extinction is is sort of even just once you've experienced Bernhardt style, even to look at the size of Extinction, you think that's that's kind of exhausting. Like that that looks exhausting, right? There's only so long I can do this 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 rant and beyond that i think you feel it's going to transform into something else which might not be as pleasant so like a rant is funny and energetic for a while and then mm -hmm. i don't want to be around this anymore <laughs> i don't know <laughs> maybe but um yeah so are you are you planning on writing more on bernhard now or are you uh what are you working on at the moment i'm working on two books one is called Critique of Erotic Reason, which is about um, eros in fiction. Mm. It's part, part memoir and part essay. The other is uh, a more conventional academic book about Hölderlin. I think the title is going to be Hölderlin and the Nature of Poetry. So the question is, am I going to write more about Bernhardt? I don't seem to be able to stop, so I don't have any plans to, but no doubt it will happen again. I think if it does, I'll probably write about, you know, one thing we didn't talk about for his dramas, mm -hmm. which were tremendously popular while he was alive in Austria and in Germany too. And I have sort of been unkind to his dramas in the things that I've written, but uh, I think maybe I wasn't fair. And it's because I've been thinking about Hölderlin and the nature of poetry, 
it occurs to me that um, the most lyric works that he wrote are these dramas. So maybe maybe I'll go back and think of them in terms of lyric as opposed to theater. Have you have you gone and seen any of the dramas? Do they are they still run the dramas anywhere? I mean, they're still somewhat popular. I don't think so. I think they've sort of become classic in the words deadening sense. Hmm. That, it, that it had something to do with the way that the Austrian public, in particular, but also the German public, was eager to see who he would insult next. And uh, it was a you know very very media oriented you know the theater spilled out into the streets when bernhardt wrote a play of course that's that's gone now that he's dead but maybe you know maybe there's more to it than that that was sort of what i complained about that uh, his theater was predicated on being performed by certain actors in certain settings you know in the united states bernhardt's theater has failed utterly and I think it maybe has done better in Italy and France. I don't know about the kingdom, but uh, it's it's curious that what people read is only the prose, and uh, the dramas are just kind of a sidelight. So maybe maybe that question needs to be revisited. Mm. Makes me wonder if he was alive today, who he'd be outraged at. If it would still be Austria, or if it would become would have become more global. I don't know. Good, good question. That's another peculiar thing. You know, he was so focused on Austria. Why should such a provincial writer focused on these, this provincial place? Why should he have such a worldwide success? That's a, another of the many paradoxes. But people, you know, people looked at him and identified with who they identified with his outrage. Whatever he was outraged against, they were they were outraged by something else. But the nature of his. Uh, expression of his outrage has found a lot of resonance in a lot of places around the world well that seems like a good place to finish up it's been a fantastic conversation i enjoyed speaking steve Dowd, thanks very much you bet bye-bye